the Super Kit Academy. Don't rush to do it. You see it if you can. God's got a message for us this morning. Amen. He's got a message for the church. For this church. And so we welcome you out there in Facebook and YouTube. We thank you for joining us today. We are, as always, having a marvelous time here. The anointing is flowing. And I believe God's word is about to flow. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you right now for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Your presence. Your manifested presence in this place. And Father, we know when you show up, yokes are destroyed, burdens are removed, bondages are dispatched and crushed. Sickness and disease has no right to the body of Christ. Lack and poverty has no right to the body of Christ. Oppression and depression has no right to the body of Christ. So help us today, Holy Spirit, see the truth. And that we know that we know we can walk in that truth. And that when we proclaim the covenant words of this book. Those words will work for us just as well as they work for you, Heavenly Father. Just as well as they work for Jesus. Just as well as they work for Paul and Peter, James, John. All the apostles and the disciples. They work just as well today. As the day, Heavenly Father, you release those words, let there be light. So this morning, let there be light in this place. And we thank you for it. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thursday morning, by the time I get to Thursday morning, I've gone through, I've talked to the Lord about what he wants to do on Sunday. Uh, I've laid out my notes and a potential lineup or outline. And as I was just, I start out always praying and just praising our Lord. And about half hour into that, the voice of the Lord rose up in me, and this is what he said. The church is not prepared for battle. I just stopped. Sitting in my chair, stopped and sat back. I said, Lord, did I hear that right? And I heard it again. The church is not prepared for battle. And then he said this, when not prepared for battle, not prepared for victory. And so I sat there for a moment. I said, okay, Lord, you said the church. You're talking about our church or are you just talking about the overall church? And I got no answer, which tells me we're part of that. Are we really prepared for battle? And if we're not prepared for battle, we're not prepared for victory. Turn to the book of Psalm. Psalm 15. Psalm 15. David has a couple of questions. Do you ever have a question for God? I mean, I have. I've had questions. I don't question God, but I have questions for God. You understand that? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> David, in Psalm 15, verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And the Lord answered him. 
He that walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. What a full answer. And folks, that's all of it right there. He that walks uprightly or walks godly or holy before God. He who is willing to work righteousness in his life and he who speaks the truth in his heart. What is the truth? Jesus clarified the truth. He said, sanctify them with your truth. John 17. Your word is truth. God's word is always true. And what he's saying here, speak the truth in your heart. Folks, verse 2. If we want to abide or live in God's tabernacle, if we want to abide and live in the holy hill, and we could say it this way, if we want to abide and live the way God wants us to in his kingdom, we just need to follow the path that he just laid out in verse 2. How difficult is all that? I mean, how difficult is it to understand what he just said? Walk uprightly, walk in godliness or holiness. Now let's go over to verse uh, to, uh, Psalm 16 and verse 7. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 11, that the Holy Spirit is our counselor. John 16, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who will guide us and lead us into that truth. Let this get down in your spirit. The Holy Spirit only knows one thing. The truth. That's all he knows is the truth. So in that case, what is he going to tell you? He's going to tell you and guide you in the truth. Amen. He's our counselor. Amen. And he says here, my reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. R-E-I-N-S. And I looked that word up in the Hebrew. And it means the soul. The mind, the will, and emotions are the reins. And when I think back, we, we had a horse on the farm. He was a very ordinary horse. But when I rode him, I could steer him or direct him by the reins. I would direct him, pull him. And, and he'd fight that sometimes. But if I pulled hard enough, he'd go. Mm -hmm. What the Bible is telling us and what it told us in Romans chapter 12, it says that if we will renew our mind, we will transform. See, we've been re regenerated in the spirit, but now we've got to transform our lives. By bringing that transformation to our soul. And letting the soul get in agreement with the spirit man. So that we are reined or pulled in or directed by God's word. Amen. 
we, we talk about, you know, in the faith circles, and I'm, I'm part of that faith group. I firmly believe in name it and claim it, and grab it and blab it, or however you put that. I firmly believe that. But I believe also that we've got to get our soul in position to agree with our spirit man. Right. Oh. So that we we go in the direction that the word is leading us because I believe that this word of God is truth. And it will follow the truth and make it our authority that nothing can get in our way. What a great class we had this morning. Now, there wasn't a lot of shouting and hallelujah and all that in there, but we had some good, good class time, good instruction that came from the Word. And one of the things we talked about in there this morning was the image. Who do we see ourselves as? What, what position do we see ourselves in? Do we really ever believe, get to the point where we believe we are in the position the Bible tells us? We are the image of God, folks. Larry brought up, we, we've got God's DNA. Amen. What does that mean? We got his blood run, running through us. We've got, we've got his characteristics. We've got his spiritual forces. We have really, when you come down to it with the regeneration of the spirit, man, from the old sin nature to now this new nature, we got everything in us that God is. I said, we've got everything in us that God is. Amen. But yet Peter made a comment. He said, for us to partake of that divine nature. Ah. We have a choice. We can, and, and let me just put it this way. I'm not for trying to demean the event. But we can just partake of the new birth and leave everything else on the table. It's our choice. Right. Psalm 23 said, God set a table before us. Right in the very face of our enemy. In other words, God wants us to step up, sit down at that table, Partake of what's on there and let the devil just watch us eat what God put on that table because he knows when we get up from that table, his time is finished. He's done. Because we are no longer afraid of him. We're going to look him in the face and say, I won. Not I'm going to win. I won. Amen. The battle, as Jerry Seville put it years ago, and uh, tremendous book, the battle was in your mind. That's the battlefield. The devil is trying to pull our mind off in the direction of the world and the corruption and the mess in the world, while God is trying to pull our mind into the word and the victory that the word gives us. Can you shout at him for that? Amen. Amen. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is my right hand, he's my strength and my power. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh shall also shall rest in Hope. Remember what Hebrews 11 says? It's God's definition of faith. 
I mean, the, the church has tried to define faith for probably 2,000 years now. Why don't we just read the Bible? Right. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So first of all, faith brings the substance to something we're hoping for. Hope doesn't have it yet. Faith says, I got it. It's mine. Faith says, I have evidence of what I'm hoping for. I have evidence of what I'm believing for. And so I can rest in that. I can rest in that. Yes. That for some reason, I, this past week, I got phone calls and talked to several different pastors. And by the time Friday came around and after talking to several different pastors, I came to a conclusion, Rob. Pastoral ministry is not oppressed. It's not oppressed. They're all troubled about what the news media has to say and what the government's doing. And, and folks, let me tell you, it's not our government right now. It's the politicians. There's a difference. Amen. We need to get back to government. Amen. Where we send statesmen, Amen. not to Washington, not politicians. Amen. Mm -hmm. Statesmen who will represent the people. But... Not just that, but our Constitution. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, somebody said, well, what is our Constitution? Let me show it to you. You got it in your hand right there. Great. The Constitution of the United States of America was written from this book. Amen. Amen. With godly men who prayed and wrote down things that were there. We need to get back to one nation under God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We're trying to put this nation under something else, but it's still one nation under God, and it will remain that way until we are raptured out of here. Shall we amen to that? Amen. I'll move on. Amen. Verse 10. Can you say this? For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Amen. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, he's not saying we won't see it in the world. He's saying you won't see it to the point where it touches you. Right. Now, watch verse 11. Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Hallelujah. Right. Now, if you understand and you study David... And David always had somebody after him. <laughs> I mean, there was somebody always trying to kill that man. And yet here he says, you're going to show me the path. Your presence is my fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Well, he showed us the path. It's in verse 2 of 15. He that walks uprightly, he that works righteousness, he that speaks the truth in his heart. Ephesians 2 6. Paul writes, We were made to sit at the right hand, made to sit with Christ in heavenly places. And where's Christ? He's at the right hand of God. He said in Matthew, all authority, all power is now given unto me. But he did exactly what God had him do, which God already had pronounced in the very beginning. He gave that power and that authority back to man in this earth. Amen. Why did he do that? Because that's what God did in the beginning. He told Adam, take your dominion. Take the blessing. And so
subdue this earth. Amen. Go over to 1 Timothy. And I don't know if uh, Larry got that change or not. I have to tell him but there was a mistype in the outlines if you try to follow them. It should be 1 Timothy 6. Larry says, got that change. No, I just noted. No. 1 Timothy 6. Now let's begin here. Remember, he's, God is going to show us the path. But let me tell you, tell you something, folks. On the path, there's a battle. Because Satan doesn't want you to walk that path. Because it's your path of victory. See, you walk that path to victory the night you received, or the day, or whatever it was, that you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now here's the point, folks. When we received him as Savior, we should have also received him as Lord. Hello. Y'all here this morning. Now watch us in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Whew. Let me read that again. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, I was looking at something during this week. I've got several commentaries, some of them I read, some are just sitting on the shelf collecting dust. But one of the one of the ones that I do read is Adam Clark's. And here's how he put that. Godliness is a thorough conformity to the image of God and the mind of Christ. Well, I had to read that. Chris, three, four times, I thought, that boy, that is really good, and that really specifies it. it. It clarifies it. Godliness, a thorough conformity to the image of God and the mind of Christ. And if we'll do that, it's going to bring contentment. Amen. Amen. Now, when I grew up on a farm in western New York, we raised goats. But across the street was a cattle farm. That fellow had, I don't know how many cattle he had. Three, uh, he, he must have had about 600 because he raised both beef cows and milking cows. And to, to, to watch the pasture that he had these in and just watch those cows stand out there in that pasture. Did you ever watch a cow? They're in contentment. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing bothers them. They sit out there and chew it and now and then looking around, enjoying the weather. You can't, you can't not pretty much upset a cow. Well, when we're in godliness, we're like that cow out the pasture. We're content. We're content. Amen. Let me go on. For we brought nothing into this world. Now, turn your ears up a little bit. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therefore content. In other words, when Paul said, and I think it was in Philippians, he said, content, be content with where you're at. But he also said, don't stay there. Grow. All right, now watch this. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful hurt lusts, which draw men, which draw men in destruction and perdition. Now, don't misunderstand what Paul's saying here. 
He's not saying you can't have wealth financially. He's not saying you can't walk in the health that God has provided or the things that God has provided. What he's saying here is these people in verse 9, they fell into a temptation and snare and they were foolish with those things. They were hurtful in their lusts for it. Why? Because they sought the riches through lust and through greed. And there's no faith in that. See, God's word tells us he's not pleased with those who don't follow faith. Hold your place there. Go to Hebrews. You're right there by it. Go to the book of Hebrews in the 10th chapter. Verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Shout amen. 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 But we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. In a lot of circles right now, folks, you're born again, you got everything. That's your spirit. And yes, you got everything. But we got to get the soul transformed. Through the renewing of our mind. Now look at verse 38. Let me read these two together. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws back from that faith, my soul, this is God talking to us, shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back under perdition, under rule and loss and destruction. But we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, are you of them that believe to the saving of the soul? Yes. All right. Let's go back to 1 Timothy. Because he tells us something here in verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. What a statement. In other words, the love of money. And you know what, folks? You could be sitting here without a dime in your pocket and still love money. You could be uh, sitting here with a billion dollars in the bank and love money. So it's not the amount. It's the heart. Where's your heart at? But the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some covered it after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So he says, but thou, O man of God. Now, we got any men of God sitting here? Yeah. That includes women. God's not politically correct. He's spiritually correct. We got any men of God here? Oh, man of God, flee these things. Flee the temptation, the snare, the foolishness, and, and the, the lusts. Flee the love of money. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Now, we as the body of Christ, we must have the truth of that verse of Scripture. We've got to have it. Say, oh, come on, Pastor, I want to hear a message on faith. How to, how to get my financial situation straightened out. Get my body healed. I'm telling it to you right now. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. See, we've got to hear the Word of God. And faith comes. Now we looked at this in Bible study this morning. 1 Peter 1.19 When you hear a message like you're hearing right now, there's a light goes on. 
but it's a little flicker of a candlelight in darkness. And we think we got it. <laughs> but see, then the Bible tells us, you study. So you take what you get here today, and you go home this week, and you study these scriptures that we're talking about. And now the day dawns. Oh, we've really got it now. No, you ain't done yet. Pardon my English. Because there's a point of taking the study and now meditating on it for the day star to arise in our heart. For true and full, great faith. See, each level is a level of faith. But there's great faith. Amen? Yes. We need that great faith, right? We're in, I, I firmly believe, folks, I don't know about you, but I believe we're in the last generation of the church. I believe the rapture is upon us. And I know others have said that and so on, but I, I really believe it is. I believe there's enough things in the Bible. We're, li we're living right now in Matthew 24. Earthquakes all over the world the last couple of weeks. Even in Ohio. There was one in Ohio. We've got relatives up in Buffalo. They said they had an earthquake in Buffalo. New York. Look at the earthquakes that have hit Turkey. There was a cyclone hit New Zealand. We look outside right now, the sun's shining. We just had a 70 degree day. Los Angeles, California is under snow. The weather's all messed up. Well, what's going on? Uh, Paul wrote in the book of Romans, the earth is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's us. Mm -mm -mm. Let me read this 2 Timothy 6.11 from the New Living Translation. But you, Timothy, are a man of God, so run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. To pursue something means to follow in a like direction. To pursue something, and I like this part, means to seek it in order to obtain it and take it. So he's saying here, we are to pursue this. Go after it. God's given it to us. Righteousness. Godliness, faith. Love, patience. Meekness. Let me zero on that for a moment. Meekness is not sitting in the corner letting the devil beat you up. Just sitting there letting the devil do whatever he wants in your life to your children, to your husbands and wife. To your grandchildren, to your nation. That's not what it is. Let me show you meekness. Hold your place there and go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Because that word meekness, according to Strong's Concordance and Thayer's Bible Dictionary, it means humility or humbleness. And again, God defines it for us. First Peter chapter five, verse six. Humble yourselves. Hmm. Well, you see, Brother Jerry, God is humbling us through sickness and disease and lack of poverty. Then why did Jesus shed his blood on that? So we be delivered from that? Hmm. 
So it gets pretty quiet when you start stepping on this stuff. Why would God tell us that we're going to, he's going to humble us through sickness and disease and then tell us he delivered us from it? No. Love doesn't do that. And God is love. Humble yourselves where? Under the mighty hand of God. Under God's authority. Under God's power that he may exalt you in due time. In other words, you put yourself under the authority of God's covenant word. Put yourself under the authority of the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the authority of God's word. Put yourself under the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and put yourself under the name of Jesus Christ and it says God will exalt you. We don't have to exalt ourselves. We don't have to lift ourselves up. We don't have to promote ourselves. We've got to wait for God. And we've got to put ourselves under his authority and his power. We talked about this in the class this morning. Oh, I had a hard time not preaching this message in that class. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus made a comment. He says, it's the Father in me that does the work. Yeah. It's the Father in me that does the work. And what he was talking about is the Father's Holy Spirit in him was doing the work. Well, folks, you've got the same Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the church got some kind of idea, got a different Holy Spirit than the Holy Spirit. Right. We got the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Yeah. Living in us. Yes. Whew. My. Ah. One of the ministers called me was a lady. And she was talking about some things and asked me to pray with her. That's why she called me. And I said, well, before I pray, I've got to tell you something. And I did. And then I had a hard time praying for her because she put the phone down and I could hear her. She was running around the room yelling and screaming and shouting. <laughs> and praising God. And she come back to the phone. And I said, well, sis, I'm not sure I need to pray anything. You got it. She says, yeah, I did. She said, I just needed to be reminded. She said, I knew all that stuff. It's really in there. She spent three years at Raymond Bible Training Center. But she says, I let some of it slip. Hallelujah. But she got it back. Folks, we need one another. And sometimes we need somebody to help stir us up. Not beat us up, stir us up. Okay, man. Okay, I'll, I'll get off that. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And here's how we do it. Casting all your care upon him or upon God, for God cares for you. In that passage of scripture, the word care there is used twice, and it's got two different meanings. It's two different words. The first care, casting all your care all your anxieties, all your worries, all your fears, all your problems, if you would, upon God. For God gives you grace and provides whatever you need. Amen. And that word right there also means favor. When you take those cares, those anxieties, worries, and fears... And you give them to God, He will favor you to overcome those. Glory to God. Well, I thought that was shopping right there. Yeah, they did. What are we doing here? Renewing our mind. What should we be doing 
when pain or the doctor's report says you got a sickness or a disease, what should we be doing? Casting the fear, the worry, the anxiety over to God. Because he's got the provision to overcome that. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. Now, most people would think if you don't worry, you ain't right. <laughs> you live out there in La La Land. No, I'm living in spiritual land. Yeah. That's not a La La Land. Yeah. We're living in the spiritual land. We're, we're living, really, where our bodies are here, but the rest of us has been recreated to understand the spiritual realm. And folks, it was a spirit being that created this physical realm. And therefore, that spirit being has authority and power over this spiritual, over this physical realm. Right. Well, when we got born again, we moved in as sons. Amen. To the Father. And how many fathers, natural fathers, who have had a business, and when they get to a point and retire, they give their business to their sons? Come on. All the time. Well, God finished his business and sat down and rested and said, here, you take it. Well, man messed it up. Jesus had to come and show everybody what a true son of God is. That's right. Took back, folks. Mm -hmm. Not going to take back. He took back everything that belonged to God. He took the keys of death away from Satan. He doesn't hold those keys anymore. And therefore, those keys will be to the point where there is a generation of the church that will not die physically. It will be raptured out of this place. Hallelujah. And I believe that's us. That's right. Amen. But we're going to have to do what God told David. And what Peter's talking about here. That we humble ourselves. And he says, be sober, be free from all these intoxicating influences. Be vigilant about it because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Who? The devil. You resist steadfast in the faith. That's true. That's true. Oh, wait a minute. I thought faith was for acquiring things. Well, we just found out faith is to stand in the face of the devil and put him down. He has no authority over the church, folks. We've been redeemed. Colossians says we've been redeemed from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God. Whew. Glory. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now watch verse 10, and, and please stick around here for just a few more minutes. But the God of all grace, who has called us into eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Now, we take that out of its context. And that's where they get. We, we've got to suffer through sickness and disease and lack and poverty and all this stuff. And then when we get to heaven, we'll be redeemed from that. We are redeemed now. Amen. Yes. What does he say? The suffering that we do is humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God and turning the problems over to God. And then the Holy Spirit gives.
gives us the answer to all of that. And we just put our faith on in God and in his word and put the devil to flight. Amen. James said it this way. He said the same thing Peter did. But he says, submit to God. Then resist the devil in the fleet. I can't tell you how many people in, down through the years who have stood in a line and said, no, oh, the devil's all over me. The devil's just after me. Well, you haven't submitted to God. Um, excuse me? But not only do I want Kenneth Hagin's and only things, I want his boldness. Amen. Amen. To bring the truth. I had one lady up here. She was having a problem with her family. Her son was in drugs. And a bunch of other stuff going on. And she says, I can't get the devil off my family. And I just looked at her. I said, well, have you submitted to God? Oh, she got mad. <laughs> well, of course I had. I opened up James. I said, submit to God. The devil resists the devil on his way. Well, if not, then that what that tells me is she's not submitted to God. She got bad. She's not been in this church since. Can't handle the truth. Folks, yeah. I don't know. When I come up, <laughs> oh, Lord, I don't want to go there. <laughs> All right. One of the minister's conference I was at, I was called up front by Jerry Seville. Oh, I got excited. Oh, all these people, Jerry Seville's called me up front. He just pointed at me, you. I come up, and when he started, I wished he had called anybody else but me <laughs> out of that place. Correct. The first words out of his mouth, you have aborted God's plan. Ugh. But then he went from there and told me. Now God is telling you right now, forgive yourself and start walking in the power of the Word of God. See, he just didn't leave me stand there. You aborted the plan of God. How to get back into it. And how to work with it. Folks, a prophet doesn't just come and tell you what's wrong. He'll tell you, if you keep going on that path, this is what's going to happen. But then he'll tell you how to correct it and what the results of that will be. Let me see if I can finish this up. What is it that Keith said the other day, Keith Moore, when we were listening to him? I am now fixing to fix the clothes. <laughs> Something like that. Let's go back to 1 Timothy 6. Verse 12. Fight. Shout fight. 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 What's that mean? We've got a battle on our hands. But look what he says. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto you are also called and hast professed a good profession. Now, I want to go one more place here. Let me read this out in the Amplified. I don't know if that in your notes, if you've got the outline. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of the eternal life to which you were summoned and for which you confess the good confession of faith before many witnesses. Now go back to the first chapter here of First Timothy. Verse 18. This charge I commit unto you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on you, that you, by those prophecies, might war a good warfare. Well, okay. And, and as I was preparing all this this week, I said, Lord, I need a better defini definition, I, I believe, of prophecies. Because the church has this one-track mind 
Prophecies is telling us about a future. But this is more than that, folks. And here's what the Lord gave me. Prophecies is God making known his desires. Through God's written word. Through the voice of the Holy Spirit. And God's, and here's how he put it, God's chosen prophets. We've got a whole denomination out there trying to train people how to be a prophet. You either call or you ain't. It's that simple. All right? Yeah. But listen to that again. It's God making known his desires for us. Through God's written word, through the voice of the Holy Spirit, from God's chosen prophets. Now watch this. We're to war a good warfare with that, holding faith and a good conscience. Which some have been put away concerning faith and made shipwreck, or that shipwreck means rough waters. Conscience. Let's define it. The conscience is the ability to understand. It's the ability to be aware of something. It's the place of reason. It's the place where knowledge is stored. And in Thayer's dictionary, he says all that the same as the concordance of, of strong, but then Thayer adds this. It's the soul. It's the soul of man. Now, the Bible says faith is of the heart. The spirit of man. But folks, if you got a battle between your soul and your and your spirit, you got a problem. We got to get the soul lined up with the spirit man. And now all of a sudden you got two in agreement and where there's two or three touching anything on earth, it shall be done. You can do that within yourself. And you're going to have to ask yourself when you walk out of this this morning, did he give us anything that wasn't in the word? Check it out. Check it out. The heart and the spirit working together. Now Peter said in 2 Peter 1 and verse 4 that God has given us these great, that is exceeding great and precious promises so that by these exceeding great and precious promises we might partake of the divine nature escaping the corruption that's in the world. And part of what I was hearing from these pastors, and three or four of them this week, part of what I was hearing from them was the fact that there's no escape from the corruption that's going on in the world right now. My Bible tells me there is. Yes. And the escape isn't just leaving this earth and going to heaven. Because James put it this way, or 1 John put it this way, there's a place we can go where the devil can't touch us in this earth. And it's not the grave. Because Jesus walked around this earth and he didn't care what the government was doing. He didn't care what the politicians were doing. He didn't care what the church was doing. He didn't care what the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing. They weren't going to interfere with what he was called to do. Are we here? Hmm. Holding faith and a good conscience. Let me finish up right here. Peter said, We need the knowledge of God. He said it twice. We need to know His righteousness, and then he said, We need to know His knowledge twice. Now, 
It's a very close look. We have in us, in the reborn human spirit, everything God is. Everything. But we have to grow in it. We have to mature in it. Amen. And I used this example in the class this morning, and I'll use it here again. When I went in the Navy, and the, here we are in boot camp, and about two or three days in, they gave us a rifle. But they didn't give us any bullets. Now, what fun is a rifle without bullets? <laughs> but we had to take that rifle, we had to take it apart, put it back together, clean it. We did that for several for several weeks. Then finally they took us out onto the range and gave us bullets. And I found out why they didn't give us the bullets before that. <laughs> Some of those guys have never seen a rifle, never touched it, never knew what to do with it. They couldn't have hit the broad side of the barn. See, I grew up on a farm. We used rifles and stuff. But I learned to hope so much. God has given us all the weaponry, but we've got to grow in it. We've got to learn to control what's in us. We've got to discover God's righteousness, his right way to do it. Matthew 6.33 But first and most importantly, seek, amen, strive after God's kingdom and God's righteousness God's way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God, and all these things will be given unto you also. We're out there trying to use our faith to get stuff, and God said, if you just follow my directions, you'll have it. You'll have it. Well, Part of his directions is the just to live by faith. So we need to learn how to do that. And one of the things we learn, lean and nerd, yeah, let me give it to you in tongues and you interpret it. <laughs> one of the things is we learn and we grow. Yeah. And as we grow, we've got better information on how to live by faith. And what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks is how to tap into and partake of God's divine nature. Did you get anything out of this this morning? Yeah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. And thank you, Holy Spirit. Every Sunday, I tell you, my voice is yours. Speak through me. Yes. And I pray this morning that I heard your voice clear in everything I said in this place today. And I pray that every word that has been spoken penetrated every heart. Touching us and building us up in a new and living way. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you out there. God bless you. Just have a faith-filled, healed, prosperous week. Nelson, what do you got?